Um, I'm Sandy Thompson, Director of Possibilities, Plains Art Museum in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. Um, today's topic is uh, corporate art collections. You know how and why do businesses, corporations, collect and display art? Um, we have an incredible panel, both locally and nationally, uh, representing uh, Fargo, West Fargo, Seattle, and Louisville, Kentucky. But before we get going, a, a little bit of background. When did corporate art collections start? Was it in the 15th century with the House of Medici, supporting and collecting Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, Machiavelli, Galileo? Or was it in the 17th century with the Bank of England? Or in the 18th century with Banco de España? Nope. Corporate art collections are a relatively new invention, and they really began in the 1950s with David Rockefeller deciding that the Chase Manhattan Bank should begin purchasing art. And who followed suit? Other banks. In 2021, the largest art collection belongs to Deutsche Bank with more than 70,000 artworks with UBS, Unicredit, JP Morgan Chase, and RBC not far behind. Microsoft, however, ranks number five in that list. Today, banks are the most important corporate patrons of the arts in the world. Why? Because, as pointed out by Arnold Witte, Associate Professor of Cultural Policy at the University of Amsterdam, from the 1950s onward, bankers were really aware of the fact that they could use art and become a new Medici, that is, patrons of the arts. And that influence is spreading. Despite the pandemic, banks have continued to collect art. Additionally, 78% of the Association of Corporate Collections of Contemporary Art, who knew there was such an organization, 56 members have continued to collect art during the pandemic. But the larger question is, why collect art? There are a variety of reasons. Bring employees into the contact with art to enrich their lives. Help staff view their work creatively. Promote creativity. Introduce human element into the corporate culture. Promote a positive corporate image where customers make a, make a direct connection between the corporation's art collection and its activities. And engage the desire to provide patronage. That means actively supporting working artists. All as part of corporations' cultural responsibility. In the 1960s and 1970s, corporations began to collect art as part of their public relations, brand identity efforts, even strategies. The feeling was art can inspire, elevate, develop new perspectives, become an essential part of corporate human resources. Today, corporate art collections have become as much about clients as employees. And to do that, experts, consultants needed to be engaged. Additionally, corporate art today has become more about artists by providing outright purchases, commissions, residencies, particularly supporting living artists artists who are, not surprisingly, less expensive to collect. Though some corporations with financial wherewithal collect significant masters, both past and present, but some have also become little more than aesthetic additions to the corporate environment as decoration or furnishings. Today's art and business brunch presentation, corporate art collections, features a group of representatives from across the nation. They are, and I'm going to start with uh, Alyssa Adams uh, from West Acres Mall in Fargo. Kara uh, Ber Berge from Burge from Lumiere Group in Seattle, Washington. Sandy Piazz, Microsoft. Her title is much too long to read out. Um, Ivy Oland 
from Sanford Health Systems in Sioux Falls. Mackenzie Olson, representing Epic Companies in West Fargo. And Alice Gray Stites, who is the, essentially the chief curator for 21C Museum Hotels. So we're gonna start the conversation with some introductions. Uh, the introductions are a little bit of background and how you got to where you are in relationship to your collection. So we're gonna start with um, Kira. Fantastic. Well, Sandy, thank, it, thank you so much. It's really great to be here and I think you set the stage so well. So I'm Kira Burge. I'm the business development and outreach manager for the Lumiere Group. And the Lumiere Group is the foremost art collection management firm in Seattle. Um, we actually work with clients across the Puget Sound that have offices um, globally. And we specialize in life cycle management, art advising, and collection care. So our team has unparalleled experience working with corporate, public, and private collections. And the clients you would recognize that we work with include Microsoft, so I've worked with Sandy before, Stoll Reeves, Capital One, and the Port of Seattle. Um, and to trace kind of how I got here, before joining the Lumiere Group, I was the director of the Seattle Art Fair, which was a four-day event featuring over 100 galleries from around the globe, robust VIP offerings, as well as dynamic programs and talks, um, and took up a footprint of 250,000 square feet. So I did that for the past six, 10 years. And then previous to that, I was in the gallery world, both um, the commercial side and the nonprofit side, running different types of spaces and events. Kira is also a practicing artist, I believe. Or has well, <laughs> my art practice is in boxes in my basement right now, <laughs> but I do have uh, degrees in fibers and textiles and arts administration, which is my educational background. Alyssa. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Alyssa Adams and I serve as the COO of West Acres Development in Fargo, North Dakota. And my role spans the spectrum of oversight and involvement in general operations, leasing and marketing of West Acres Shopping Center, uh, which is a locally owned uh, 1 million square foot regional shopping destination. And although I have no formal art background uh, within my role at West Acres, I have had the pleasure of getting to know our arts community as well as garner an uh, understanding of the arts in general. And on a personal level, I have a deep love of art and the richness that it brings to our lives, as well as the connections that it creates. Uh, you can see there's a slide here of several photos that I'll, I'll walk through, um, but West Acres has a regional showcase program that focuses on arts, culture, and philanthropy. And within my role, I work with our team to enhance our guest experience through culturally rich experiences, including art of all kinds. Uh, West Acres has the largest collection of local art within our region. And you can see some of that on display in this slide, some of our food court uh, vitrines with art, as well as uh, the tile work going down the hallway above that by local artist, Jessica Wachter. Um, and we have over 75 local artists within our, our regional showcase and uh, well over 100 pieces throughout our halls. Uh, we're also home to a creative art studio called Aptitude, a concept that was developed by the Arts Partnership. Uh, you can see that photo uh, with one of the artists standing in front of the studio doors. And then we also host an artist in residency program of which we just welcomed our 10th artist in the last couple of weeks. And in this slide, you can see the, the three pieces uh, next to the abstract piece. Those are trace pieces left behind by uh, two of our artists, as well as the um, image on the top right is one of our artists um, from a couple of years ago in her space uh, working. Uh, the photo on the bottom left is one of our art uh, spaces where uh, a group of local artists uh, a consultant that we work with worked to curate their pieces and install them in that space and we also paired it with fashion and then a, a unique uh, photo above that of the morph exhibit uh, which was uh, plains arts museums uh, school of abstract painters pulled together that using mannequins so just a few examples of some art that we have throughout our center mckenzie 
everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Mackenzie Olson. I'm the VP of Marketing and Public Relations for Epic Companies. Um, I also work for Epic Events as well, which is another organization um, at, that's a part of us. Uh, so Epic as a company, we you know believe in investment, development, and management. And we've kind of evolved over the years as our mixed-use buildings have been able to provide a place for people to live, work, and play. And a large part of that is being able to provide art in our buildings that make it feel like home, that make um, people enjoy the spaces a lot more, want to stay there. As you can see in the slide, a few of these pieces are by local artists in town. We've truly believed in kind of spreading the wealth and being able to work with multiple artists. And uh, the company Epic Events that I also uh, do marketing and PR for, it believes in art and entertainment. So we actually have uh, two resident artists on staff. One is an intern and one is full time. And those are also local artists here in town. We were able to host the first annual group art show this past fall. We had over 50 artists at the show with 150 submissions. And we were able to also put on a community art experience here coming up. But what we believe in is basically we have such a large canvas for artists, whether it's in the underground parking, which you can kind of see with the number 13 over there, um, the wall space that we have in the buildings, which you can see in the top middle, and then as well as just the exterior of the buildings and being able to do stuff in the plaza spaces that we also help with uh, at the lights in West Fargo, POW, MAA Plaza in West Fargo as well. And then the ones that we're also developing right now in Bismarck, Minot, um, and Grand Forks. So very exciting there. You can see uh, and the, on the right hand side, we teamed up with Landon's Light Foundation and we're able to uh, do this bronze sculpture of Landon honoring him, which is right now in West Fargo. It's a very unique piece. And then the rest are just by some local artists, uh, Nancy Ness, Pine Tar, Rando, Kate Baldock, Not Hid, and then Edwin Dagus. So we've been able to work with quite a few different artists. It's been just really great to be able to incorporate that. And we were able to get very involved in believing in the art world, supporting local art, and being able to just work with so many artists. On the bottom left is our next project. Uh, that's just right now kind of the drawings of it. Those will be going up, but they're actually uh, Pixar style lights that are being built that will be out at the lights as well. And artists will be able to um, paint those or do whatever they'd like uh, on the exterior of those. So uh, pretty exciting projects that we've been working on, but we're very happy to be involved and work with so many great people in the community and be able to provide uh, such a different experience for those who are coming as well as a destination location to see it. And uh, we, another part that I haven't mentioned, I guess I'll just kind of mention quick. One way that we got very involved with art was we met so many artists through my boss's other company, Spicy Pie, um, which is a pizza place here in town. So if you ever get the chance to go in there, you'll see some really artistic work. They have large chalkboards um, as a canvas for artists. And then they also provide the option for artists to um, work on the pizza of the months every month and do different things. So it's just, it's been a really great experience. So thanks for having me today. Oh, thank you. Sandy. Yes, good morning. Thanks, Sandy. And thanks again for having us here today. Um, as I said, I'm Sandy Piatz and I'm the site leader for Microsoft's Fargo campus. And then I also lead community program management for our real estate and securities teams across the Americas. And uh, Microsoft's actually uh, been building its art collection since back in 1987, started in Seattle. And it started as an employee-led uh, effort to really curate art for Microsoft. And now today, we have over 5,000 pieces in our art collection across over 140 buildings in North America. And it's, it's really a, a great collection that Microsoft has and it it really fosters innovation for our employees and it also is leveraged for a lot of our employee engagement efforts and and one of the pieces that I wanted to start out and share with you is is really an employee led piece and uh, one of the things that um, many of you if you're from the Fargo area you might recognize this picture because um, that is a building of the horizon building and that is the lone tree that is in front of it and so when um, the land that the Microsoft campus was on in Fargo, when it was first homesteaded, that is one of the original lone trees when that land was homesteaded. And we had a lot of employees this year that had celebrated their 20 year anniversary with Microsoft because they came through the Great Plains acquisition. And so as a gift for all of those employees, we 
um, commissioned a local artist, Marcella Rose, to do this beautiful oil painting of the horizon building with the lone tree in front of it. And then she created uh, a print of that oil painting and we had it put on this wood piece and with lacquered over it. And each employee got a print of that oil painting as a gift for their 20th anniversary. And so the reason I share that with you is this beautiful collection of 5,000 pieces that helps foster innovation for employees and um, provides wayfinding throughout our buildings and um, is just beautiful aesthetic across our campuses is also art also provides a way of employee engagement and gifts for employees when they celebrate anniversaries. And this is just one of the beautiful ways that we partnered with a local artist to do that and give them a commemorative piece this year at Microsoft. And that's one of the things that art has done for us and myself as the site leader is we leverage it for a lot of employee engagement um, there at the Fargo site. Thanks, Sandy. You know, sometimes we think of Microsoft as this behemoth, but um, uh, this really brings it down to the human level. Thank you for doing that. Ivy. Yes. Um, hello. Thank you, Sandy, for hosting this. I'm so excited to be a, a part of this great panel. Uh, it's been fun to learn from everyone already and, and connect with the other panelists. Um, I'm here representing Sanford Health. I am the head of environmental design for Sanford and I work at an enterprise level. Um, those of you in Fargo-Moorhead, I'm sure are familiar with the organization, but it is the nation's uh, largest geographic uh, rural healthcare provider. And uh, you can see there's a broad footprint and a large reach. And so I support our facilities team in design and planning um, and art integration is a primary part of my role with Sanford. Um, to Sandy's original question about how we ended up here, um, I began as, uh, I had a studio art degree, um, I had a, a retail art gallery, uh, but a very pivotal point of my career was when I connected with the Society for Arts and Healthcare and began to understand the, the evidence and research that supports the inclusion of art in um, healthcare, working and education and uh, environments. And so for a number of years, I worked with other um, corporate uh, corporations and institutions as well as the, with the healthcare field. Uh, I consulted uh, for Sanford Health for 13 years on the outside before officially joining the team. Um, but we have, in my time with Sanford, placed art in several million square feet of facilities and invested as many or more dollars uh, in our local art, artists and art businesses. Um, placing art for the benefit of, of health and healing outcomes. Um, and that truly is the driver for us, is that art, uh, while we love art for art's sake, um, we're truly investing in the art as an opportunity to positively impact health outcomes. Um, and so those projects have ranged in scope and style. Um, I just, a couple of reference images that I wanted to share, um, a fairly recently completed building at the top is our Imaginetics. It's a very forward looking healthcare facility. Um, and we have this beautiful installation overhead had a light and sound interactive opportunity. There are kiosks at the floor to learn about genetics and genetic medicine. And um, the light installation above is responsive to the sound of your voice, the shape of your smile, uh, unique identifying factors. And I have to say, we didn't foresee this at the time, but this is where in Sioux Falls, they administered um, COVID vaccines. And so the 15 minute wait time was in this beautiful glass domed lobby with this light installation overhead. And it couldn't have felt more appropriate for the type of, of work in healthcare that was taking place there. Um, the bottom, a couple of pictures of the Sanford Children's Hospital in Sioux Falls. This was actually the first project I worked with Sanford on, and it's quite literally a castle and was very uh, whimsical, uh, a, a great starting point. Um, in, in this project and many others, we worked with dozens and dozens of regional artists to incorporate original artwork throughout. Um, on the next slide, uh, Savannah, if you don't mind forwarding, I just wanted to share a couple of uh, hometown features. This was the Fargo Medical Center in Fargo, and I assisted on this, uh, the new medical center project, which opened in 2017. Um, and we had some fantastic artists from the area. And so you might see some familiar pieces from uh, Kimball Bromley, a local professor in the upper right corner, uh, Val Halverson, that's um, a, a quilted fiber art piece in the lower right. Um, in the center, a few images, we had a, a series of large, beautiful mosaics created by Janet Flom. Um, she hit, you know, I wanted to include the details below because you can see and discover these tiny little chipmunks and ladybugs. And she included some prompts for positive distraction as guests wait while they view these pieces. Um, to the left of that is Tracy Frizzell highlighting 
um, architecture and history of the Fargo-Moorhead area, uh, and artist star Wallowing Bull on the on the lower left, who created a beautiful uh, piece to help um, convey uh, some cultural history in a in a modern and contemporary context. So these are just a few of the pieces. It was hard to choose, but um, wanted to share a few of of these images with any of you who haven't yet been in the medical center. Thanks, Ivy. Appreciate that. Alice, tell us about 21C. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm really enjoying um, this panel. Um, so 21C was founded in Louisville, Kentucky in 2006, and today is in nine cities across the U.S. Um, 21C Museum is a multi-venue museum now with a total or aggregate of um, nearly 90,000 square feet of exhibition space. All of our um, lobbies, public spaces, meeting rooms, event space are dedicated gallery spaces that are um, that are really for the temporary exhibitions, which change periodically. I'll get to that next. But what you're looking at here are some of the site-specific commissions that really define each building um, and distinguish it. Um, so we'll start uh, in the upper right and go counterclockwise. That is, uh, that's the mothership, that's 21C Louisville, um, with Sirkan Ozkaya's David inspired by Michelangelo, which is twice the original size of Michelangelo's marble sculpture in gold on the corner of Main and 7th Street. Next to it, um, it is the entry the ceiling in the entry of 21C Lexington, um, that spectra line by uh, New York-based designers and artists Soft Lab. It's based upon um, the asymmetry of crystals. Below that is a projection by Brian Knapp. He's a Cambridge-based artist, um, and this is his healing tiles. That is projected onto the, the hallway that leads to the public restrooms. Often when we are looking for, what we look for are these interstitial spaces that will carry visitors um, from one place to the next and transform the space architecturally as well as engage people visually and conceptually. The healing tiles is this biomorphic pattern of orange and green and yellow that respond to the movements of people as they walk across the space. It tears and then as the artist explains, it heals like a wound differently for each with each interaction. Therefore, kind of keeping this invisible record of all of the, um, the people who have passed through. On the upper left is uh, Rafael Lozano Hammer's bilateral time slicer intermix. And this is a permanent installation um, in on the first floor hallway of 21C Nashville using um, biometric technology that's typically used for surveillance. Um, you stand in front of this mirror, it captures your face and then slices you in two and puts you in a lineup with lots of other people who've, who've visited recently and in the past in the two restrooms that flank the saw that flank that space are also video screens showing this kind of mix mix up of, um, of visitors. Underneath um, bilateral time slicer intermix, I'm sorry, that's not a great picture because there are actually three uh, fiber optic tapestries that hang within a nine story interior atrium at 21C Cincinnati. This is the work of Astrid Crow, um, And I watched her weave part of that on a loom in her Copenhagen studio. The fiber optics are fed by uh, monitors that are equipped with color wheels so that the colors are constantly changing. In the daytime, you don't see the color, but you, it's still quite impressive um, because they really respond to the, the, the space, the weather, the different lighting conditions. And at night, you get a spectrum of brilliant colors. Next to that, and uh, the, the last two pictures you see are site-specific projects for 21C Oklahoma City, which is in a former Model T Ford assembly plant built in 1916 and operating un almost until, until we opened there in 2016. Um, which is 100 years later. Uh, so on the left, you have uh, James Clar's River of Time, um, used, uh, inspired by the technology of the assembly plant. And you can see that uh, it, it, those, the, the shapes evoke um, 
conveyor belts and it is in fact a flowing river of time. The colors of the plexiglass are meant to bring to mind the flowing waters and in the center is a neon digital clock. Next to that is an image of one of three installations on each of the guest room floors at 21C Oklahoma City um, entitled You Always Leave Me Wanting More. Um, and Kira, you might rec you might recognize the yeah because yes. there was well, a, a I know prototype. The artist <laughs> very well. Sutton, yeah, I thought I, I I love those guys. Sutton Barris Color is a Seattle-based trio of artists, and they exhibited a prototype of this project at the Fry Art Museum, uh, yeah. I, I believe, in 2015. So the arrows, um, which are inspired both by commercial signage and carnival lights, um, you can see there's like a, a lighting design that, that the light bulbs flicker on and off. Um, and those are six, nine and 12 foot arrows shooting through this, uh, the ceiling of each guest room um, floor. So, in a, so ne um, next slide, please, Savannah. 21C, um, it produces over 20 original exhibitions a year, solo and group exhibitions of contemporary art from all over the world. The collection itself is uh, 50, half of the collection is of non-US based artists. Um, and a few other statistics I will share with you um, are, is that it is about 45% non-male identified and about 35% artists of color. Um, those are statistics that I've asked about more and more often, but they reflect the founders' interest in, in global art. Um, there's art from over 120 countries in the collection, which now numbers about 4,000 works of art in every medium, um, from painting, sculpture, photography, film, video, installation, performance, and, and now um, we have quite a collection of uh, AR and VR based work and the digital collection in total is over 200 works, making it one of the most significant collections of digital contemporary art in, in this country. And also ensuring a very steep learning curve for those of us maintaining those works. Um, so what you see here are sample uh, are images from a variety of exhibitions. On um, now we'll we'll go clockwise. Um, on the upper left, that's a work by. New York based artist Zoe Buckman called Champ. Those are boxing gloves and that is a neon uterus. That is um, a, a, a work that is featured in our current exhibition, The Future is Female on view at 21C Durham. Um, next to that, you see an image of people checking in at 21C Cincinnati where the exhibition Dress Up, Speak Up, Regalia and Resistance is on view. Um, and that is a painting by Kahinde Wiley behind the front desk called Morpheus. Next to that is another image of the lobby in 21C Cincinnati right now with works by Ebony G. Patterson, Nick Cave, and um, Jody Paulson, who's an artist from South Africa. Below that is uh, an image of a project that we did in collaboration with the Contemporary Art Center Cincinnati. This is an exhibition, a solo exhibition for, for, uh, for an artist named Albano Afonso, who is from Brazil. And that traveled to, uh, to, to 21C Louisville as well. Um, in the center is a, another museum collaboration that is ongoing with the North Carolina Museum of Art, where we worked to the curator of the, uh, the modern and contemporary curator at the NCMA and I worked together to um, present the first US museum show for an art for South African artist Vimbota. Um, this is an exhibition called Still Life with Discontent that is currently on view at 21C Louisville. Um, these those two exhibitions in particular uh, are consist of some work from the permanent collection at, augmented by loans. We do borrow and loan actively to a wide, wide range of institutions, museums and other cultural organizations. The small photo on the bottom um, is an image of uh, a, a, an ongoing exhibition that's current. That's actually a picture of 21C Bentonville. Um, but that show Pop Stars, Popular Culture and Contemporary Art is currently at 21C Lexington and from left to right works by uh, Brian Pomier, Nick Cave um, and Bruno Penado. And finally on the far left is an image of 
the lobby at 21C Louisville when the exhibition Labor and Materials was shown there. That was the uh, with works by a large sculpture by Kara Walker um, and then works paper pulp tapestries in the background by Lena Puerta. This exhibition was the inaugural exhibition for 21C Oklahoma City uh, at Labor and Materials. And um, the goal, at least for the, in the inaugural exhibitions is to curate exhibitions that reflect upon the site, the city, the space. So to answer your question, Sandy, how did I get here? Uh, so I began my um, career in New York as an arts writer and moved to Louisville uh, when I got married and uh, went to work at the Speed Art Museum um, as an adjunct curator. I was also doing some independent consulting. Through my work with the Speed Art Museum, I met the founders of 21C, Laura Lee Brown and Steve Wilson, and have joined them on their journey to share their collection and grow it and share thought-provoking art and ideas with as broad a public as possible, so. Thank you, thanks, Alice. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have to build another hotel in Fargo, Sandy. Um, I, I, I think we need I to get- so. I, I think so, I think we need to get 21C idea. here. Um, <laughs> thank you all for that. Um, I think it gave our guests an opportunity to see the breadth of, uh, of art across the country uh, and the, uh, the, the depth of your engagement with the process, not only uh, for the art, for art's sake, but for um, the patrons and your employees. Okay, now we're going to get into the question. How and what was the motivation and when did your organization start a collection? Sandy, I can speak a little broadly to that of kind of okay. how we work with clients and then maybe toss it to Sandy a little bit. Good. Fantastic. Oh. So um, each client is unique, kind of as you all have seen, everyone comes at it with a unique perspective. So we always begin with a conversation about objectives. Um, we work with clients to establish a framework for their art collection that informs new acquisitions, and we advise them on best practices for data management, ongoing artwork care, and how best to protect their artwork now into the future. So we're setting up and kind of administering that day-to-day -day, um, for each of our clients, and it's really unique. I think Sandy touched on it a minute ago uh, with the Microsoft Art Collection, which was established in 1987. As she said, it began as a grassroots movement with the goal of making a meaningful difference in the work lives of our employees. And so today that mission or that framework has really evolved and my team has been instrumental in the evolution of that um, to make sure that it continues to create a positive work environment, fosters innovation and promotes creative excellence. And Microsoft has a specific commitment to diversity and prioritizing supporting artists early in their careers that are local to the location where the work will be living or cited. So when we're in Fargo, we're working with Fargo-based artists. When we're in Atlanta, we're working with Atlanta-based artists. When we're putting work in the Seattle area, we're looking at kind of the Pacific Northwest there. Um, so I think it's really about finding what differentiates the client's perspective and what's really true almost to the brand, but really the ethos or um, kind of the aspirational goals um, for each of our corporate clients. Sandy, you wanna reply, respond, yeah. add? Um, yes, I'm gonna to continue to build on what um, what Kira was sharing. And she talked about the local artists and. And one of the things that we do is we continue to build on that by leveraging that through employee engagement and efforts. So for example, uh, in Fargo, we have this beautiful art collection throughout the site that is curated by local or through local artists. In addition, uh, we also bring in local artists through our arts ambassadors. Um, our arts ambassadors is an employee networking group that is made up of employees that are super passionate about art and of, of all mediums and all forms. And so we work with our arts ambassadors to bring in local artists to do lunch and learns or brunch and learns and showcase local artists in our commons area. Um, we also do fundraisers during our give month where we will partner with the arts partnership to actually do an art auction. 
Um, sometimes we'll also do an employee art um, showcase where employees will showcase their own art because we have a lot of budding artists just within our own employee group. And so there's a lot of ways that we can showcase local artists um, through our arts ambassadors group as well. Um, one of the other things that I just, I love about our art collection that is it's local art across the site, but it also helps change the aesthetics of where you move throughout the campus. So for example, if you're in a commons area across our sites, which is a more lively, upbeat, you know, it might be where the cafe is or the coffee cart is, you're going to see a lot more lively, energetic art. Whereas if you're in more of a, a working area or a, we'll call it like a library sitting type area, you're going to see a lot more soothing, calming, engaged type of art. And so the way that the art is art collection is set up throughout the, the site, it also helps change the mood of, as you move through the site as well, which helps support the innovation and the work that the employees do throughout the site as well. And I, I kind of heard that some through what Ivy, you had talked about and how you set up the art from a healing standpoint um, at Sanford. I think it's kind of the same thought process on how you leverage art to really support the person, the whole person kind of designed from the inside out type of concept. Thank you. Thanks. Alyssa, I, I know the family behind West Acres is passionate about the arts, not just the visual arts, but the performing arts. Um, and we're fortunate to have one of them on our board. That's a, a, a point of full disclosure. Um, but how did the how did the, the collection, that whole process start um, in, a, in a mall setting? Yeah, so art was an important part of West Acres culture from the beginning, uh, mostly included, you know, in the design process. One of our earliest installations was the Fountain of Abundance by Richard Seitz that was originally in Center Court and has since been refurbished and moved to the J.C. Penney wing. Um, and early on, a lot of the focus was on art as, you know, events, but that really shifted in the early 2000s when there was an intentional focus put on, you know, supporting arts and arts organizations locally within our community. And going back, you mentioned, um, you were referencing Carol uh, Slossman. She's actually had a really strong influence on that regional showcase program for us and her overall um, knowledge and understanding and connections to the arts community have uh, been one of the reasons for the growth of our regional showcase program within West Acres. But what we saw is that shift happened in the early 2000s and it was really intentional of including art throughout the mall. And you know, one of those main focuses is creating this warm, welcoming environment for the guests that, that come. Um, but we also noticed that when we were intentional of focusing on, on creating these art spaces and adding art to our space, we were also able to create an, uh, deeper connections to our community. So connections not only to the artists, but between the artists and, and the community itself. Uh, we have a very large public space. And so one of the things that we love about it is that people don't expect to see art when they walk through a local shopping center. It's, you know, it's unexpected to walk around a corner and see a large art installation. And so we love creating a space that's warm, welcoming and, and free to the public to come interact with artists in a really unique way and vice versa, the artists with the public. Mackenzie, um, you're in a development organization, uh, lots of projects throughout the Fargo area and perhaps beyond. Um, and you're in a position, you didn't come to bio the arts. I mean, you're a marketing person, so, um, I, I believe. Um, how was it that, um, Todd got interested in the arts uh, other than um, through spicy pie. Well, he would say it actually goes back to his mom being an English teacher um, throughout the years. Uh, that actually was kind of the tie uh, in there, you know, not being artists ourselves. It's 
it, it, you do have to kind of go into it a different path just because of um, the nature of it. And most times it does come from having an artistic background. And I will say that I can be creative at times, but I'm not an artist. Um, but I think one of the big appreciations for me is as we build our buildings, uh, we always have somewhat of a theme or um, the community rooms, you know, we just did Vinay and Moorhead and it has a it's a marine, I guess, theme. So we just commissioned some artwork from Laura Reddig. We're really excited. She's going to be hanging up. But I think one of the biggest things that we have learned too is to let, when once I meet the artists upon, you know, I walk them through the space and we kind of talk about the space itself and what we'd like to see in the vision and how you want to make people feel. Because a lot of it is the way people feel when they come into your spaces. And I've really let them run with that creativity a lot. And like they leave, they think about it for a while. They usually come back to me and say, all right, here's some things that I thought about after our meeting. And we've been able to, I mean, the pieces that have been created for us have just been phenomenal. And I, I can't thank sometimes the artists enough for being the ones that meet with me. We understand the vision and then they kind of just run with it and being able to allow them to have their creative freedom. And I think another thing to note is artists, um, they're all, they're all different. They all have their own, some are maybe on the more higher commission side, some on the lower, some go to art shows, some, you know, display their art and some are just doing it because they enjoy it and they want to be able to do it on the side. And so we've taken that into consideration too. They're all different types of artists and being able to use different ones and a variation of them is really important to us too. And that's kind of where we've been not only able to commission pieces, but also able to find spaces, whether that's underground parking, um, being able to use our hallways, being able to furnish units, just so many different options um, for artists as well. So that's been great. But I think for us, we've just found that there's so much more than just the buildings to us. And we have the people and then we have the event side and being able to provide that art committee side that we have now and have resident artists on staff. It's crazy how many things come up every day that involve art and being able to um, support it. So that's kind of where we've been able to expand, I guess, from the initial beginnings of believing in it, meeting people that are very involved with it, having canvases for it everywhere throughout the state now, um, and being able to work with people that are able to create it. Thank you. So Ivy, uh, as, as a recipient of some of Sanford's uh, uh, abilities, uh, medical abilities, uh, I've had an opportunity to experience uh, some of the aesthetic uh, interludes uh, at, at uh, Fargo uh, Sanford. Um, how did it start at this huge, I think, surprisingly large uh, health system. Uh, how, but yeah, how did it get how did it get injected into the corporate culture? Sure. Well, you know, I think there are probably there were times throughout history where perhaps a significant piece of art was commissioned for a lobby or an entry point. But I would say it was probably within the last 15 years, uh, at least in Sioux Falls with Sanford, where it became a, a very intentional planned part of new facility construction. Um, and oftentimes, you know, um, <laughs> what changes people's minds or, or awakens them to the, the impact of art is when it's sometimes done poorly. And uh, I hope they don't mind my airing their dirty laundry, but I recall touring a cardiac cath lab space in 2009 as we were preparing for a new heart hospital build. And it was a cath lab prep and recovery area. And so patients were typically in small individual rooms. They were gowned. Um, they had to be have their groins shaved, many of them. Um, they were not warm and inviting or comfortable spaces, a bit isolated. And as we toured the existing space, the one piece of art that was hanging on the wall in each of those rooms were poster prints of icebergs floating in water, um, which in South Dakota, I have no idea who would have picked them out or why. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, it was sort of that awakening to, to the you know, leadership and other clinically focused people to say, wow, you know, I've worked in this room for 10 years and it had never occurred to me, but once that occurrence takes place, you can't really go back. And so I think that, you know, my first significant project, as I mentioned, was the children's hospital. And when they saw how well received the outcome was, 
um, not only by the community because we supported and included uh, local artists, but by patients and what a big impact that had on shaping their experience and outcomes and that of staff. It was, um, it was truly valuable. It wasn't just an accessory or you know, a pretty piece of decor. It was a, a fundamental part of the healing environment. Um, so you know, that's really, as an evidence-based design practitioner, you know, I approach art selection and art, you know, artist inclusion from a little different lens because again, it's patient first. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, I would say that the, uh, the existing body of research supports that regional nature-based imagery is most conducive to positive outcomes in a healthcare setting. So that is typically a starting point for us. Um, that's also why we, uh, one of the reasons why we work with local artists, because they know it, they're going to create those opportunities for familiarity and comfort for patients um, within those facilities. Um, and it's been exciting to see how once it's done successfully in each region, you know, for the first time, it just grows to the, to the extent that I have a hard time keeping up with it <laughs> at present in our new facility projects. Um, I, I did want to mention too, Sandy, I saw a question pop up from uh, an arts educator. So pleased to see that they're, um, you know, considering their students, a big part of my work revolves around um, uh, skill building in the professional uh, sector for young artists. Um, you know, at least in healthcare projects, we don't have the luxury of being able to go back into a space very often once it's open. It's pretty challenging to get back in once they're, they're serving patient needs. So it's so critical. Um, most of our artwork is site specifically commissioned and we have to coordinate with construction, IT, you know, you name it. So we really get one shot. So a big part of uh, the determining factor in who I work with are artists with a proven track record of not only you know, technical mastery of their medium or creativity, um, but their ability to deliver on time, meet deadlines, work within provided parameters. So that's, I'm so thrilled because as a former art student myself, a lot of times that's lost over in, art, in, in college programs, I think. And in order for artists to launch um, from art school to successful working artists, that is so critical. So uh, just really glad to see that question come out and um, you know, I'm happy to, to make myself available as a follow-up resource to, uh, to your local folks asking about it as well. Oh, great, thanks Ivy. Alice, so most of the conversation has uh, about who's involved has revolved around local artists. That's not 21C's primary focus and the, the initiation of 21C was the vision of two people, uh, very specific, uh, you know, really somewhat corporate, you know, a, a very specific corporate mission wrapped around, or uh, not wrapped around, but wrapped around by uh, artwork. Um, how do you go about your process? Are you, you know, you've indicated who started it. Uh, we indicated that you, you know, you had a meeting with them and got completely enamored with what they were doing. Uh, obviously, they weren't enamored with your track record and you're where you are. But how do you engage uh, the artists that you're you're working with? Well, um, thank you for that question. And there are so many different ways I could answer it. Um, what I would like to start by saying is that, yes, it is the brainchild of really visionary collectors, Laura Lee Brown and Steve Wilson. And I would des I describe what they did as taking a private passion, which, co which art collecting is, and giving it a public mission wrapped in a corporate structure. So their idea was that they wanted to have, they saw what contemporary art museums and centers could do to revitalize downtowns in other cities. And this was a hometown project only at the beginning. This was only meant to be for Louisville. They saw that the downtown was not as vibrant culturally or economically as they felt it should be. They're very passionate also about pr the preservation of land and believed in the early, as early as, you know, the early 2000s, that the way to preserve land is to invest in the urban core. And so they wanted to do something that would add to the cultural life of the city and drive economic growth. Um, they didn't want to start a private museum. 
the charges admission. We're all of our locations are free to the public, twenty four and open twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we obviously had to dial that back a little bit in recent months, but um, but that is, that is the goal. That was the goal to create a an accessible museum quality center that would that would not be dependent upon admission tickets, tax dollars donations. And so they hired a research firm who came back and said, well, the business that your city really needs is more hotel rooms. And that was how 21C Museum Hotel was born. The founders are also passionate about agriculture and food, and hence each one has a chef-driven restaurant. Um, so their collection was really the, is the genesis of what is now the 21C collection. They are intensely curious. Laura Lee Brown likes to say we were, we live in the corner of curiosity and they are not shy. They're, they're big risk takers. They buy artwork by people who are extremely well known. And then the collection also does include a lot of local artwork. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to, so to address that, what, um, when the second 21C number two came in late 2012, and keep in mind, number nine opened in 2020. So the last few years have been like working for a startup, which seems like it, you know, is the opposite of working in the museum world. But um, at, when we were opening 21C Cincinnati, and I will confess, I live only, an, and Louisville is only an hour and a half away. And I thought, whoa, we can't open the doors without artwork from the local community. So we developed a program called Elevate at 21C. And this started as being dedicated space on each of the guest room floors for showcasing loan works of art from that city, that community, that region, which the museum manager, there's one dedicated, I have one dedicated staff person to each site. The museum manager changes that say three or four times a year, depending on all kinds of factors. Um, the that space is designed differently differently for each building. Some space, some in Oklahoma City, there actually there's enough space to do, you know, small group shows. In other uh, spaces, there's you know a single vitrine. It just it ranges. And the idea is is that people who are staying in those hotels, who are guests of the hotels, as opposed to visitors from, you know, the public from that community, would get to see art that is made that is local. Um, and it would broaden the audience for those artists. Now, um, 21C doesn't get involved in any of the commercial transactions that may transpire from that, that may be generated from that. We do have, we've had a lot of instances of guests being interested in buying the art and we connect them with the gallery that represents the artist or the artist directly. Um, 21C has added a, at least a dozen works to the collection from all of these cities and I, uh, just have to say that it's been like the greatest privilege and education to get to be really embedded with art communities in nine cities across the U.S. And I don't have to tell you all great art is being made all over this country by people who are both known and not so well known. Um, and so we have added to the collection and in one case a, a commissioned two artists from Cincinnati who work together as a team called Future Retrieval. Um, to do a permanent project, a large project um, for 21C Durham. So giving the artists opportunities for their, you know, when you want to answer your question more directly, Sandy, um, one of the selling points or one of the attractions that artists have to having to doing a commission or having their work acquired by 21C is the possibility of it being seen by so many people. Not all of the exhibitions will travel to all nine locations, but they will, you know, most of the shows, unless they're smaller local shows will travel to more than one. And so it expands the audience, expands the appreciation and allows them to connect with artists, audiences, collectors, museums in a range of different cities. So that is actually one of the, um, the you know, one of the, the, the values that drives our mission is supporting artists, not only through collecting their work and doing programming with them, expanding the audience but and also helping them with professional development uh, i agree iv i think that's a real it's it's really lacking so we have we've we have um, an ongoing relationship with the creative capital foundation we've brought their workshops to many of our cities um anyway does that, that answer is it. 
that's yeah. a sweet relationship with creative capital. Wow. Yeah, I've been a consult. I've I've been a consultant at their retreat since two thousand eight, I think. Um, yeah. And we've met, and that's how I met like Sutton Barris Color, who did the project um, for Twenty One C Oklahoma City. We've worked with a lot of their artists um, because they do a great job of teaching artists how to do exactly what Ivy and Kira were talking about, which is to deliver on time, time. And, and, <laughs> and budget and within under, scope. And on <laughs> um, but I will say that one way in which 21C differs um, from you know these other ways of collecting is that we don't think about you know we don't know who our audience is like it's incredibly diverse who who's coming in from the, the public coming in from the local community to business travelers to leisure travelers to art centric travelers people have a wide range of understanding what contemporary art is and a wide range of how they're going to engage with it we try to prioritize the artist's vision and we don't, and, and to prioritize art that reflects what is happening in the world today, which means we do address difficult topics. 21C believes that art is a safe place to start challenging conversations and to change converse, conversations. And we want everyone who walks through the door to feel represented, inspired, challenged, and welcome. And that right. means that not everybody is gonna like everything, which always starts a conversation. And right. hopefully those conversations lead to making change. Well, your, the very first example you gave was the neon piece for the boxing gloves and, and a uterus. Uh, I would <laughs> say you do uh, approach difficult topics. So we have, a, we have a couple of minutes left. I have one question for each of you, very short answer. What advice would you give to other corporate leaders or business leaders about beginning an art collection? And we'll start with uh, Kira. Sure. I'd say that's really, that's really your job. That is my job. <laughs> that is my team's job for sure. Um, so I would say just to boil it down to kind of three main points. Think through your objectives and bring on a consultant. It could be someone, a curator, <laughs> could be someone like Ivy. Um, to help you shape those guiding principles before you start acquiring art, that work will pay off in spades. Um, consider the cost of ongoing care, establishing a database, legal services, insurance, things like that. I think that's often overlooked, those kind of nuts and bolts pieces. And then remember that when you are collecting art, when you're acquiring art, you're becoming the steward of a cultural legacy. Um, I think what Alice was saying around with 21C kind of functioning more as a museum space. So it's really important to the artists, to the community, and it should be to the company that the art in your collection is treated as both a cultural and a financial asset when you're thinking about it. So really a holistic approach. Alyssa, well, what advice would you give? You're a really nailed, nailed it on the head there. And, and I agree with, with everything that you mentioned. Uh, one thing that I will add is just the the relationship side of it. And so, you know, taking the intentional time to form those relationships with the artists that you're working with to truly understand their story and, and their work itself. So I think taking that time is really important in the relationship side. Mackenzie. I think one thing uh, to consider it for the corporate collection, I guess, would be a lot of people don't realize how much opportunities and spaces that they have for art already in a lot of your spaces. So maybe just, you know, do a walkthrough, kind of consider your options. And as always, there is inside art, but we didn't really go touch a lot on the outside options as well, whether that's um, sculptures, displays, opportunities for people to come to visit. So I, I would definitely consider that and take that into you know thought as you're going through the process. The relationships is huge. Um, being able to know how you can support the artists, whether that's just going to one of their events and showing up for them to support them. It may not even be purchasing a piece. Being able to share their stuff on social media has been huge. And asking, you know, we get asked probably every day, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, email, hey, would you guys mind promoting, even promoting an event for them? Or would you mind sharing our piece? Uh, I think that's that's really built those relationships and been able to kind of let us be known that we do support that art culture. Um, one of the last things I guess that we, we consider is, and I kind of already touched on it, but there's all different 
ranges of art. And I saw one of the questions come through, whether that's, you know, the high caliber, the low caliber, um, and just being willing to be open-minded and think about both because there is opportunities for both and you have the option for both. And yeah, I feel like with our events and so many different sides, we we've been able to meet so many artists. We've been able to think of art so much differently than just uh, a picture on the wall. Um, which of course we love those and we love how they make the spaces feel and that's been huge for us and that's kind of how we kicked off our start, but also in the ways that that we've thought differently about it and um, having now these event spaces in general. Um, ev everything is an opportunity for art and we also have allowed one thing I didn't mention is we have um, video boards here in town and we actually are we put out requests right now for local artists or nationwide artists to submit their art and we'll display them on the video boards for them. So it's a way for us to give back. That doesn't cost them anything, um, but it shows that we're supporting many of them in uh, our corporate culture. Thank you, Ivy. Uh, well covered by my fellow panelists, but um, <laughs> thank you all. I will just echo, you know, out of the gate, Kira, you hit a lot of the major things is that developing guiding principles, know what your objectives are, engage a professional and have a plan. You know, every time I've worked with an organization, there's generally a desire for an ROI. And that doesn't necessarily mean your art is going to deliver dollars back to you. But, um, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, increasing your market share, uh, improving employee satisfaction, uh, reinforcing your branding, all of those things have value. Know why you're doing it first, and then you can still have a diverse but cohesive collection. Sandy? Yeah, I, uh, I I agree with a lot of what exactly what Kira said, you know, find that expert, that partner that you can leverage that can really help guide you in the right direction. Um, also, your community partners, um, the Plains Art Museum, the Arts Partnership, just who are those community partners that you can leverage and work with? And then um, does that design from the inside out, you know, the employees or the patients and who you're serving with that art, I think is and the values and the, and the mission of what you want to accomplish, just keeping that center to the core of why you're doing what you're doing. And then the, the last thing that I would say is um, to remember that art could be leveraged everywhere. There's this amazing book um, called If Aristotle Ran General Motors, and it goes into these five values that Aristotle would use to run a business. And one of the values is beauty. And it goes super deep and wide into these chasms about beauty and how beauty is just the aesthetics of everywhere around where we are and how you can leverage it to, to help us work better, live better, be better. And so it's just, I think about art as just a way to help us move through life and make our life uh, more peaceful. And uh, Aristotle, they use Aristotle's values as one of the ways that could be leveraged that way to run General Motors better. So just a, a quick tip there as well. And last, Alice, what advice would you give somebody who wants to start an art collection? Uh, I would say they need to talk to this whole, this group. Um, the only thing no, we are recording I, I, the only thing I would like to add, and I'm picking up on what you said, Sandy, and referencing back to something you said earlier, Mackenzie, uh, which I loved hearing that you've learned that artists belong everywhere. Artists are problem solvers. And I think it would be a lot more corporations and individuals would be inspired to develop relationships with artists and to collect the work and to live with the work if they under, when they come to understand the power that art has to shape our thinking, to get us to ask questions, to look at the world differently. Um, and the success of 21C and its rapid growth for, since 2012 is testament to that. When we opened in 2006, there were people were very skeptical. I mean, the art world was very skeptical, um, and the business side was was very skeptical. But people saw that success, and all of these investors and developers from all these other cities have come forward and said, "We see what a business with art at its heart can do," and they have. All of the ownerships groups have understood that it's prioritizing the art and the commitment to being a public cultural institution that, that has driven the success. The, the cultural relevance is, is completely integral to the commercial success. 
I, I must admit that in 2000, probably in 2007, I learned about 21C. I was the uh, director of development at the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe. And my first reaction is, what the hell do they think they're doing? And 15 years later, or actually 13 years later, I was recommending to a local uh, development company that they look at 21C as their hotel management. Um, so Thank you. <laughs> you, you guys are doing one hell of a job. Thank you all. I appreciate you taking this time, both today and, and some of you, yet, uh, what, yesterday, uh, Monday, to go through the, the, the uh, preview. Uh, this has been fabulous. It was even better than I thought it would be. Um, I, I must confess, this was not my idea. Uh, it came from one of my colleagues um, who is currently en route uh, from here to move to Florida. Uh, but we're going to try a, a, a something a little uh, adventuresome. We're going to try a remote, permanent remote access. So we'll see how that works. Um, again, thank you all. Uh, we have recorded this for everyone. So if you want to, uh, I think we'll put it on our website. Uh, so if you want to review it, uh, that's great. We can mail, uh, we can send you guys the links on that. Um, and I encourage you to connect with each other. Uh, there were connections already that had been established when we first talked. I think it, Ivy had a relationship or knew, some, knew Alice some way and maybe Kira as well. Um, I, I encourage you all to do that. So um, as to uh, Art and Business Brunch, um, hopefully this is the last one. We'll go back to our Art and Business Breakfast format uh, in November. Um, not sure what the topic is, but since the day that I have picked is Veterans Day, it will probably be art and the military related. So we'll see you then. Have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you.